We're going through our series dealing with the shepherd king, and today is presentation number three, the title being Ginormous Faith. Now you can probably gather what our subject is based on the title. Back in 2006, a boy named Jake Oliver was walking home from school across a field in Bristol, England, talking on his cell phone, and a mugger jumped out of the bush and said, give me your cell phone or I'm going to beat you up. Uh, he picked the wrong person to mug. Even though Jake was a foot shorter, he wasn't ready to surrender his cell phone. He said, I'd worked long, hard, doing a lot of jobs to pay for that phone, and I hated the idea of giving it away. So when he resisted, the thief swung at him. Jake said, I sidestepped his punch and delivered a right hand to his face. It broke his nose. There was a lot of blood everywhere. He held his nose and he ran away. The thug did not know that Jake had recently won the World Karate and Kickboxing Boxing Association Championship <laughs> for his age. Even though he was about a foot shorter than his attacker. Uh, no word had ever been heard from the attacker again. <laughs> Just one of the many little David and Goliath stories. The story of David and Goliath is so famous it's become a metaphor for whenever some small individual or company has to go up against some monolith or a large person. And uh, it is a fascinating story and it is actually a true story. Uh, this is one of the great stories of history as well as Scripture. And I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the first book, most of our time will be spent in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And with the help of God, we're going to go through this chapter today where you find this wonderful account. 1 Samuel 17, 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and they were gathered at Sokoth. The word Sokoth means fortress, which belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Sokoth and Azekah and Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah. Elah means oak. Must have been some oaks in the area. And they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now, Elah is a valley about 20 miles from Bethlehem, and it's the main passage between the area of Judea and the uh, area of um, the Philistines. You got a picture there on your screen. You can even go to Google Earth and still see where that valley is today. The valley creates a great natural amphitheater with the creek running between it. And um, see, it seems like the forces were engaged for a long time and they were fighting over territory. The Philistines were trying to take some territory that belonged to Israel. They often fought over their borders. You'll often hear the Philistines referred to by the Israelites as the uncircumcised Philistines. That's because on their other border, they often had people like the Edomites or the Ammonites or the Moabites that were all related anciently to Israel and Abraham and practiced circumcision. But they saw that the Philistines were especially vile pagans and there are a lot of um, pagan rituals and they had a fish god and, and the things that they would go through that were very degrading. And so they were their, just their mortal enemies for many years. You'll hear about the, uh, during the time of Judges and Samson and Samuel and Saul fighting the Philistines. They were south of Israel, principally more towards the coast. And um, as some have drawn a connection between the word Philistine and Palestine, because it was once the ancient land of the Philistines. And so um, here's this big battle with their mortal enemy, and they're having a standoff because each is trying to engage the other to initiate attack because you're always in the advantage if you have the high ground. You notice they're both on mountains. They got a valley between them. They're basically saying, come on, you want to come fight us? You got to come up the hill. We'll have the advantage. They say, no, you come fight us. You've got to come up the hill. And so they're having skirmishes, but they're having a battle standoff. So this great controversy takes place. And then in the midst of this scene, out marches the arch villain. It says in verse 4, And a champion went out from the Philistines 
named Gath, or named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now, um, there's some question about how big he was. How tall is that? You can actually read in the second Bible commentary, page 1018, the Philistines proposed their own manner of warfare in selecting a man of great size and strength whose height is about 12 feet. Now, I've got to talk to you a moment about giants. Um, he, you know, historians disagree with a lot of things in the Bible. One thing they don't disagree with is that there were giants in ancient time. Of course, what do you consider a giant? Um, you can read, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. Is it not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon? They even kept his bedstead as, as a, uh, a memorial. Nine cubits. How tall was Goliath? He's six cubits. No, I'm not talking about feet. I'm talking about cubits. His bedstead was nine cubits. That means his bedstead was by the common small standard, 13.5. Now you'll notice even in the Bible it says according to the standard cubit. That's because there were different cubits. Here you've got just a, a little picture of some of the uh, ancient giants. The first one there would have been Og, uh, the king of Bashan, about 11 feet, 10 inches. Uh, that is if you're using the standard measurement and then you'd have Goliath there and then you'd have the average Jewish man. This is a friend, Eric Gingold. Karen and I, we were um, scuba diving on a boat in Australia and we met this young man. He used to actually play basketball for the Chicago Bulls. He is, not joking, the tallest Jew in the world. He's seven feet two inches tall. And I was looking at pictures of him online and I saw a picture of me with him. That's me on the left. And Karen, I think, took the picture, but this other gal commented. She must have emailed it to her or something. But anyway, uh, yeah, I felt... <laughs> And it was so funny because he could not sleep in the beds on the boat. He had to sleep on deck. And when we went out, nicest guy, played chess, very bright. And as we, when we went out diving, we'd all go out, we'd take a tank, and we'd go diving. He had to have a specially made wetsuit, seven feet, two inches. And he would be out of air in about 10 minutes. We'd go out for an hour with our tanks, and he'd get out there, he'd breathe through, and he'd go, <laughs> And he just take all the air out of his <laughs> He's just so big. <laughs> Some of you have heard of Andre the Giant. They said at his peak he was supposed to be, he was an actor and a professional wrestler. He was like seven feet four. But if you look down through history, there have been a number of giants that are much taller. Reading in uh, Adam Clark's commentary, um, Pliny says the largest man, he was a, a historian uh, during the time of the Caesars, he said the tallest man that had been seen in our days was one named Gabra, who is in the days of Claudius, the late emperor, brought out of Arabia. He was nine feet, uh, nine inches, taller than Goliath by some standards. Josephus mentions a Jew named Eliezer, who Vitellius sent to Rome, who was seven cubits, or ten feet, two inches high. Benconus saw a man near ten feet and a woman that was full ten feet, uh, two inches not to mention any more than the name of John Middleton, an Englishman born near Hale. And uh, during the reign of James I, he was more than nine feet three inches high. And so, uh, there, you know, everyone knows there have been giants through history. But uh, depending on what cubit you use, and I think we've got uh, a picture here that may illustrate that. They, this is a picture of some of the cubits. They varied. You had the Hebrew short cubit, which was about 18 inches, 17.5. The Egyptian cubit, the common cubit, the Babylonian royal cubit. Now you're getting up to 19 inches. The Hebrew long cubit, the Egyptian royal cubit. And if you went by the Egyptian royal cubit, then Goliath would have been about 12 feet or 11.11, which is what the spirit of prophecy says. So he was big. This man was a virtual monster. You can read about this in Numbers 13, 33. When the children of Israel went into the promised land to search it out, ten of the spies came back frightened. Why? It says, we saw there the children of Anak, the descendants from the giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So were we in their sight. 
Deuteronomy 3.11, where I mentioned Og, king of Bashan. And then it goes on and it itemizes some of the gear that Goliath is wearing. It says he had a bronze helmet that was on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. That's the scales that protect from arrows and so forth. And it was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 150 pounds. You ever wear a coat that weighs 150 pounds? Now I could lift 150 pounds, but I sure wouldn't want to have to go into battle wearing that. In order for that not to impede him, he must have been very strong. So can you imagine putting on a coat 150 pounds? Oh yeah, barely notice. You'd have to be a giant. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. It's like a little telephone pole. And the iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and the shield bear went before him. His spear was 18 pounds. Now, I got weights I use just, I have a couple of 25 pound weights that I lift, you know, just in, in the bedroom there. And, and they're heavy if you do it a few times. I can't imagine trying to hold up a spear that had an 18 pound head on it. You'd have to be a massive guy. They had probably a bunch of attendants there in Gath that spent their time working on his armor. I mean, you couldn't just buy that off the shelf if you were... <laughs> if you were a giant like that. And so the Bible is going on to tell us that this man was a wonder. He's called the champion of the Philistines. He is a virtual mountain. He's a huge gladiator. And he comes out now and you go on to the great challenge. This is in verse 8. He comes marching down into the valley and because of the, the hills on each side and the air is clear there, everyone could hear. And he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel. Now because the Philistines, when they weren't at war, they would trade together. And they kind of understood how to speak the language. You know, you go to Europe, and if you're in Switzerland, they speak French, and they speak Italian, and they speak German, and they speak Swiss. And uh, you, when you're in Europe, everybody speaks two or three languages. If somebody speaks three languages, you're called trilingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak one language, you're American. That's what they say. But they spoke, e you know, each other's language because they, let's face it, did Samson know how to speak Philistine? I mean, when he was with Delilah, he needed a translator. So that they knew how to communicate with each other because they spent a lot of time trading when they weren't fighting. And um, even the Philistines had garrisons among the Israelites. And so he comes out and he cries out in the language of Israel and he issues an interesting challenge. Why have you come out for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you're the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, one person. Let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, we will be your servants. But if I prevail and kill him, you will be our servants. Why do we have to have all this waste of war and kill all these people? So you just send out your best man to fight me? We'll fight to the death. Whoever wins, the others agree, okay, we will pay taxes to you. It didn't mean they'd all be their slaves. It meant when one country overpowered another country, they then would pay tribute to them and uh, they would be superior. And he said, if he's able to fight me, great. It takes some courage to come out and say, I'm willing to fight to the death, but if you're, you know, 9 to 12 feet tall, it might be easier. And then he went on to defy the armies of Israel. He said, I defy, I dare. Give me a man that we may fight together. So here comes this one man, a weapon of mass destruction, marching into the valley and he issues this challenge and saying, I dare you to send me man. You got a, a million people, send me one soldier that you can fight, that can fight with me. Now who would have been the most likely to go? King Saul, the Bible says, is a head and shoulders above everyone else. Of course, a few years have gone by, Saul may have been 50 years old at this time and you're not quite as fast, so they may not have expected that. And then there's Jonathan. He had gone with his armor bearer. Jonathan and his armor bearer killed 20 Philistines. And so maybe Jonathan. He must have been tall and stately, but not near as tall as Goliath. Now how often did, how many times did he do this? How many times did uh, Goliath issue this challenge? Every day for how long? 40 days, twice a day. 80 times. That's what it says here. Verse 16, I'm just jumping ahead, and the Philistine drew near and he presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Now does anyone come out of the Hebrew camp to fight him? 
he issues his great challenge and the Bible goes on to say and, and the next one is not only is there a great challenge, there's great cowardice. From all the armies of Israel there was not a man. When Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistine they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now this is really sad because why did Israel initially want a king? Do you remember when uh, they said they didn't want Samuel anymore? And this is in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel verse 19. They said, no, we want a king over us that we can be like the other nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So every time Goliath came marching down and he started to mock the God of Israel and, and curse the gods of Israel and taunt and make fun of and I'm sure that the soldiers on the front line said things that we can't repeat in church and thankfully they're not in the Bible but we get the idea that he was defying God, using God's name in vain, he was blaspheming and the soldiers of Israel kind of just took it. You ever felt intimidated? You ever felt like the enemy intimidates you? And it goes on morning and evening, day after day and you just feel like you're oppressed and this is what was happening. If David in this story is a type of Christ then who would Goliath be? He is the arch opposite. He is the devil. And so this story of David and Goliath is not just a wonderful story to inspire children but it's really for every believer because we have all been taunted by the devil. We have all been abused and we felt like we have been uh, victims and that we are been enslaved by the enemy. And don't miss it, this is about, they said, we beat you, you're our slaves. This is about who is going to serve who. Which God is going to be supreme? It's not just a battle between armies, it's a battle between gods. And you'll notice that David is defending God and Goliath curses by his gods. It's a battle about which God is the real God. Philistines had several gods. And so he went on, he does this 80 times. They had to sit there and hear this challenge and the people of Israel are so afraid and, and the king who used to have the spirit of God but what's happened to Saul? You remember the previous chapter? The spirit of the Lord left Saul and the distressing, depressing spirit came and tormented him but the Spirit of the Lord filled David. Now Saul has lost the Holy Spirit and you know one of those attributes was courage and he has lost his courage. He's lost his backbone and when the king loses courage what happens when the captain of a team loses courage? It affects the forces and so Saul is obviously scared and this is frightens the people and maybe Jonathan said, Dad let me go fight him. He said, no you're the crown prince. I can't afford to lose you. I kind of think Jonathan was willing but there was nobody that Saul was prepared to send out. And so all of a sudden there's a change. Now you have the great contrast. Go to verse 12. Now David, you've, you've gone from the battle scene on, on the, uh, the front lines and now you go to the fields and the meadows. You've gone from the giant and now you go to a young boy. He's not a young boy, he's a young man. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite from Bethlehem, Judea. Now the reason it says Ephrathite is because the, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. There are two, maybe three Bethlehems that were in the promised land. Rachel died in Bethlehem Ephrathah. That's where David lived, that's where Jesse lived, not to be confused with the other Bethlehem. I don't know how many there are but there's several Portlands in America. You got Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine. You got several Farmingtons which is a normal name, Farming Town. Got a lot of those in North America. And so there were a few Bethlehems. And so it calls him Jesse the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judea, not far from Jerusalem, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. And the man was old and advanced in years in the days of Saul. I've told you now, Jesse was born before Samson. And he lived long after Samson. And so he's up there in age. And it says, the oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul in the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed the father's sheep at Bethlehem. So the reason that the writer includes this is the previous chapter, where's David? He's in the palace playing the harp. 
but he couldn't do that full time. They were an agricultural society. David needed to go home every now and then to help with the crops and to help with the sheep and the shearing and so forth. And so Saul, at one point, he wasn't having any depression problems. David said, uh, you don't need my music right now. Can I go home and help the family farm? So the Bible's clarifying how did David get back to Bethlehem. It says, he occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. David was happy out there. Even though he had been told, you're going to be the next king, he was glad to get out of the palace and all the problems in the palace. But he was also worried because he knew there was a war and his brothers were engaged in the battle at this point. So now you have great consternation. And you can read where Jesse, he begins to worry about his sons that are on the front lines and he decides to send David. And it says, um, And the Philistine drew near. He presents himself 40 days. Then Jesse says to his son, I'm in verse 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 17. Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands and see how your brothers fare and bring back news to them. Sent from the Father, David is sent to the front lines where there's a battle. Jesus is sent from the Father with bread to the front lines. You remember what uh, Jacob did? He was worried about his sons. He sends Joseph from the Father to his sons to seek their welfare. And so David is sent from the Father. And uh, it goes on to say, um, David arrives with his supplies they were drawn up in battle array. Verse 22. And he left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. And he ran to the army. And he came and he greeted his brothers. He comes down to the front lines. He's there on the, the TMZ. And as he talked with them, it maybe was time for the, the morning taunt. The Philistine Goliath comes out by name. He comes from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. He made his threats, his challenge again. Except now something's very different. David, for the first time, hears it. For 40 days, David's been back with the sheep. And at the end of these 40 days, David hears the taunting. Did Jesus have a battle at the end of 40 days with the devil? Okay, just think about that. And uh, the men of Israel fled. I don't think David fled. They were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he's come to defy the armies of Israel. And it'll be whoever kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. And David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? It's not just defy the army, it's defying God is the way David saw it. He is outraged. This is the great consternation. He is upset. He, he thinks this is an outrage that nobody has taken up this challenge. He thought God's with us, God's not with him. Why, why is it taking so long to find somebody? And he's making such a stir. A stir. He says to another one, what is going to be done? Now, David, in his mind, he's already thought, well, if no one will fight him, I'll fight him. I'm just, what, what is the reward? He's not really interested in the reward. He's just curious. And they said, oh, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. You know, soldiers talk, and they're saying, wow, king's going to make him rich. You get to marry the king's daughter. That turned out not to be such a good thing. But that was part of the fringe benefits. And all these soldiers gather around. David, he's starting to roll up his sleeves, and he's, he's uh, beginning to take out his sling and loosen up the leather and and he's making a fuss and a crowd's gathering and Eliab, his oldest brother, hears this when he spoke to the men and he becomes angry. Now, you wonder why Eliab becomes angry. Was it because David's courage made his cowardice stand out? Cowardice is always resentful of courage. And Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke this and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? You should have stayed with the stuff. And with who did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? The bears are going to pick them off one by one. Why did you leave them? I know your pride. You're just curious and you're insolent. You've come down to see the battle. 
Now, did David's brothers know that he had been anointed king? But they didn't really believe. Did Jesus have problems with his brothers believing that he was the Messiah? David's brothers did not believe at first. Jesus' brothers did not believe at first. But you know, Jesus' brothers later came around. David's brothers later became part of his army and they had to take orders from their younger brother. That would be tough, huh? But they eventually realized God has called him. So Eliab's giving him a hard time. And he said, you come down here, you're just curious, I know you. You always want to be in the middle of everything. And David said, what have I done? I'm just asking. I just brought the food. And then he asks this great question. Is there not a cause? So says, isn't there a reason to be outraged? Don't you care that we're being taunted by the enemy day after day? Do you want to be their slaves? Isn't anybody preparing to fight? Is anyone talking about getting ready to fight? We're just running. He saw the men running from fear. Is there not a cause? God's given us a cause. Amen? Amen. Christianity, we have a message. We have a, a fight that we are to be armed for. Then he turned from his brother. He said, I'm not going to let you discourage me. And he talks to another soldier and he says the same thing. And they answered him the same way. And there's a bigger and bigger group coming around because for the first time somebody has had the audacity to say, oh really? There's a I, I, they look like they're ready to fight. He's issued a challenge. Someone's got to take him up. I don't see anybody. Forty days he's been doing this twice a day. Nobody's willing to fight. And it creates a stir that there's this whippersnapper from Bethlehem, doesn't even have armor, who says, I'll fight the giant. And he's already asking about the reward. And finally, the words that he spoke and the stir that he makes, it reaches the king. And David says to Saul, this is now, we've gone from the great contrast to the great consternation, now the great courage. They bring him to the king. In verse 32, David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. He has this great confidence. Now, you know, Saul says, what do you think you're going to, now Saul knows David. I mean, he doesn't know him well, but you know, he knows he was in the court, he was playing for him. And he says, don't let your heart fail. And Saul says in verse 33, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you're a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. But then David now begins to exhibit great confidence and he uses evidence for his faith. Great, David had great faith. His faith is not in him. His faith is in God. But he has evidence for his faith. David says to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear, there were lions and bears back in that country before they were all uh, rendered extinct, came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it. And he didn't use a sling. He either used his hands, the way the Hebrew is, he used his hands or a stick. They used a club. And when it arose against me, he struck it and it arose, it turned. When he, it, he knocked the calf out of its mouth or the kid out of its mouth, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Well, it's kind of like when Samson, it says he took the lion, the spirit of the Lord came on it, and he tore it like a kid, like a goat. Now, you might think, oh, this is just one of them Bible stories. But actually, uh, it does happen. October 2008, Jim West was out walking in the woods of British Columbia, Canada, when he heard a noise behind him. Before he knew what happened, he was being attacked by a full-grown black bear. Knocked to the ground, the 45-year-old man lay on his stomach trying to protect himself as the bear clawed and bit him about the head and back. Eventually, he wrestled free and he struggled to his feet. The bear backed off for a moment. He grabbed a large stick and when the bear approached again, he clobbered it on the head. Seeing that the bear was dazed, he was afraid to stop, so he kept swinging. Soon the bear staggered and collapsed, bleeding from its nose and died. Conservation officials found the bear and verified the story, not to mention doctors gave him 66 stitches to prove his close encounter. So can a man kill a bear with a stick? It happened in 2008 up in Canada. 
But David didn't even get any stitches that we know of. And so he begins to tell Saul, your servant went out and I fought a lion and I fought a bear and uh, the Lord delivered me from the lion and the bear. And it says, your servant, verse 36, killed both the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine. He's a little bigger, but he'll be like one of them seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. You know, David was basically saying, I can look back and see the evidence of how God has blessed in the past and given me victory. And based on past evidence of God helping me with those things, I believe he can help me with this. Isn't that how faith should work? Do you have evidence of answered prayers in your life? Uh, how many times has the Lord rescued you and provided for you? In fact, you're here means he's been providing for you. How many times have you had some trial and you prayed and started going through some deep valley that giant's been taking advantage of you and the Lord gave you an answer and the Lord gave you an out and he overcame your problems? We forget, don't we? the miracles of God. If we make a book and just write down the record, David remembered the things that God had done to deliver him. And based on the evidence of what God had helped him with in the past, he believed he would help him in the future. That's faith. Faith is based on past evidence. And he says, I have faith in God, that that same God who worked a miracle, because it's a miracle when you get saved from a lion or a bear, a man, without, you know, artillery, that same God, I believe, can work a miracle. And Saul, he said, look, this has gone on long enough, okay? Got to send somebody. And who knows exactly what he was thinking? Saul might have been thinking, well, if we send out our best soldier and they kill him, it can look bad. If we send out a boy and they kill him, we lose, but they're going to feel bad about it. It's, you know, it's kind of like, well, I didn't want to win anyway. And uh, so, for whatever reason, he says, sure, we'll send you out. And he says, the Lord be with you. But you know, I don't want to rush past that point that um, King Saul said, you go fight and the Lord be with you because it is, Jesus said to us, go and I will be with you. Isn't that right? Go into all the world and I'll be with you. So then, could be David was also inspired. Did David know the story about Jonathan killing the Philistines? He's maybe even inspired by that. David no doubt heard the stories about uh, Samson. Maybe that's why he took off after the bear and the lion. So David heard these things and it inspired his faith. David hearing the word inspired him. He then had his own experience in victory because he had heard the stories from Jesse about Samson and Jonathan. It, he believed it and he lived it out in his life. So then Saul says, go, and the Lord be with you. Jesus says to us, go, and I'll be with you. Now, going to another sea, they make the mistake of trying to use carnal clothing to fight a spiritual battle. Saul says to David, here, you put on my armor. I'm in verse 38. He clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. And David might have been thinking, look, if, uh, if your armor is so good, how come you're not wearing it? And he put on his sword to his armor and he tried to walk. Now assuming this was Saul's armor and Saul's a head and shoulders taller than everybody else and David evidently wasn't that tall because the Bible says that Samuel was impressed with the height and stature of Eliab but not with David which means he's not even as tall as Eliab. You ever seen you know a little girl put on her mom's dress and her, her hat and her high heel shoes and try and walk around. It's kind of cute and they get two steps and they fall on their face. As here, David puts on Saul's armor, you know, and he says he tried to walk. Forget, forget about fighting. He can't even walk in it. And his head's probably sticking out. He's looking eye level through the neck hole of Saul's armor, you know, and he got his helmet kind of off, drifting to the port side. And he's dragging his sword. And he's going, look, uh, nothing disrespectful, but this is not going to work. And maybe Saul was thinking, if I put my armor out, it'll look like at least the king is coming out to fight. He's trying to get some, and if he wins wearing my armor, Saul is thinking, then I get some credit. It'll be the armor that won the battle. Now see, I think that's valid. 
I think that Saul, uh, one reason God did not let David wear Saul's armor is because if David had won wearing Saul's armor, guess what would have got the credit? Saul's armor. But David doesn't go out with anything but trusting the Lord. You'll see what I'm saying in just a moment. So he puts on this carnal clothing and finally David said, uh, I cannot walk with these. I've not tested it. He doesn't want to offend the king. I haven't proven it. And David took them off. He didn't want to be rude to the king, but he also didn't want to die. And David had another kind of armor, didn't he? He had the armor of God on. So now you go to careful collection. This is in verse 40. So he starts heading off towards the front lines. He takes his staff in his hand. Don't miss that. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the book. From the brook. From the book. That's what you call a Freudian slip because that's what I meant. What do those stones represent? He that hears these words of mine is building on the rock. And what is it that brings down that idol, the false gods in Daniel chapter 2? A great stone. So he takes five stones from the creek and can you just picture this, you know? You got the armies, one mountain, other army, other mountain, big valley between. Word is now spreading through the Israeli camp that uh, we found someone to fight. Who is it? It's a shepherd boy. And you know, there's always a gambler in the group who said, all right, I'll give you odds. 50 to 1. 50 to 1, he's not going to make it. <laughs> and so they're all taking up their bets, and they're probably all betting against David. And they see him go down, and he calmly stops, and he's sifting through the rocks in the brook, and he's carefully selecting rocks of a certain size, a certain shape, and what you may not know, of a certain density. Now, if you go to that part of the country, They've got these rocks, they're, they're special slinging stones in the valley that have a, a high percentage of um, a, like a, a bellium and it uh, makes them very heavy. Yeah, there it's barium sulfate which has a mass density of 4.2 grams. Uh, when you throw one of those, you know, the reason that bullets hurt so much is they're made of lead. Lead is very heavy. It increases the the stopping velocity. Uh, and if you got hit by one of these stones, it could really hurt, to put it mildly. Matter of fact, maybe this would be a time for me to, you, you know, we've got some props here. This is, a, this is a sling. The way that a sling works is you take a basketball, a little basketball, <laughs> When you throw with your arm, how fast can a pitcher throw? 100 miles an hour. You ever been hit by a professional baseball pitch? Have any of you ever seen what happens to professionals that get hit sometimes? It really hurts. Some of them have been knocked unconscious. Some of them had broken bones because they've been hit by a fastball thrown by an arm. That's because you're using the centrifugal force of the arm throwing. So when you have a sling, and slings could be longer than this one, um, you've greatly increased that. What they do is they take one of these stones and a good slinger. You can read in the Bible. There were men in Bethlehem. I've not tried this yet. I've not proved it. <laughs> you better, you, those in the front row. <laughs> but the idea is, and I, I, I think you're supposed to, and then you... <laughs> Well, don't send me against Goliath. <laughs> oh, you don't, you, I'm not supposed to go round and round? No, no, you really don't. Actually, you can see examples of people who know how to sling. Now, the kids that weren't paying attention a minute ago, I've got their attention now. But you have this one often has a piece of leather that ties around the, the uh, fingers. You actually, it's solid. And then you pinch the other side and you let it go. We made those out of small stuff so nobody would get hurt. But I wanted you to visualize, this is all he had. This, and he had what else in his hand? Yeah. A staff. They were bigger than that because he could use it for walloping a wolf or something. So he stops and he starts fishing through the brook and he picks five. Why five? 
pastors love to tell the story because Goliath had four brothers. And after he killed Goliath, he was going to kill the four brothers. And it sounds good. Probably not why. I think he took five stones because, I mean, and even a cowboy wants a six-shooter in case you miss with the first one, right? And uh, not only that, but what does five represent? The Jews called the law the Pentateuch because there's five books. You remember in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he said, for I have five brothers in my father's house. Five was often a symbol for the word of God because of the five books of Moses. So again, it's a symbol for the word. He takes these five stones. He puts them in his shepherd's pouch as he prepares to go out to battle. And, uh, you know, can you imagine the look on Goliath's face? There's a stir. And they see a young boy coming down and they think that... Uh, He's coming to fight, and finally Goliath realizes uh, he's not coming to talk. He thought he was a messenger. He sees the stick. He sees the fire in his eye. He got a sling in his hand. He says, he's coming to fight with me. Now you have, point 11, great cursing. Goliath thinks that he's going to intimidate David with the same kind of words that he's used before. And it, goes, it says here that... Um, When the Philistine looked about and he saw David, he thought David was leading someone else. He looked out and he said, you coming along? You? He looked about, he saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy, and worst of all, he was good looking. <laughs> he was cute. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. And so the Philistine begins to curse and he said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with a stick? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He began to stomp and to writhe and to carry on. 1 Samuel 17, 45. Then David says to the Philistine, You come to me, and this was our scripture reading, You come to me with a sword and a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now did David have a couple of weapons? He had a sling, he had a stick. But he didn't see that he was going into the battle. He wasn't trusting those things. If he had to throw those aside, God would help him kill the Goliath with his bare hands. He didn't know how God was going to do it. Sometimes when you go off and you make a decision, I'm going to do God's will and I'm going to fight the giant, you may not even know how. If you know that something is God's will, then you need to go forward and fight. Now, who is the giant that we fight? Satan. And what is it we're fighting against? Sin and temptation. Isn't that right? We're fighting against evil. Not just in the world. It's in us. And it's a battle. We've all been intimidated by the giant. He comes out day after day, 40 days. 40 represents a generation. It's a time. It's talking about an age. Just over and over. He comes and he taunts and he, he um, persecutes and he tries and we think one of these days, one of these days, one of these days, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to fight. I don't know how I'm going to resist. You know, don't worry about it. If you go in the name of the Lord and say, I'm going to go forward and trust that God will provide a way of escape. Doesn't the Bible tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Lord will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with every temptation provide a way of escape that you're able to bear it. And so you may not know what your weapon's going to be, but you go forward. And you do it in the name of the Lord and in trusting in His Word. So he makes this great confession. This day, verse 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. Now Goliath had just said, I'm going to take your head from you and feed you to the, the beast of carrion. And David, boy, talk about the boldness. He, it, he doesn't back down at all. He is absolutely courageous and audacious and he said, no, you're not. I mean, you know, all the other soldiers, you get a giant mad before you fight him. It's kind of scary. He starts stomping around. The ground is shaking. And David is fearless. He says, no, you're not going to kill me. I'm going to kill you. Furthermore, I'm going to cut off your head. Once you're down, I'm going to make sure you don't get back up again. And we're going to feed your bodies and the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air. You know what the Bible says in the great judgment of the wicked? It talks about the feast of the birds. And it's here, this is all alluding to the themes in the Bible of the great judgment day. Why? It says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 
David says it loud and clear so everybody there says, so these armies may know, so all the earth will know. He knew that this story, that God's spirit was there, was going to go beyond what was happening on that battlefield 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 years before crisis took place. Did this story go into all the earth? There are people in every religion of the world that know the expression David and Goliath that have heard this story, but it really happened. Can you imagine? Boy, I can't wait to get to heaven and see that. Um, so David goes forth to meet the giant. He says, So all this assembly will know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Total faith. Verse 48. So it was when the Philistine arose, he came and he drew near to David. David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. I mean, can you picture that? Here's this massive army. Look at the giant out here. David, by himself, a shepherd, is running towards an army. What a picture of courage and trust in God. He didn't know how he was going to do it, but uh, he was going to go through and mow them all down if he needed to. And he ran. If I was going to fight a giant, I probably wouldn't run. And as he runs, he put his hand in the bag and he takes out a stone and he slung it. And he struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead. I read that if a good slinger with a right stone and a good sling, he could fire a shell and it would have the stopping velocity of a 45 caliber. And so the stone, it goes on to tell us, it just hit him on the head and bounced off. It hit pretty hard where it actually penetrated, probably cracked his skull, sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face. He, you can read in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, his legs began to shake. He put his hand up to his face. He stumbled, and he fell on his face ingloriously. You've heard the expression, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, the whole, all the earth shook with the thud, and the whole Philistine army suddenly did the wave. And David didn't wait. David prevailed, it says, over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and he killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Now the armor bearer who had been accompanying Goliath, when he saw Goliath go down and David running forward, he did a retreat. He didn't rescue his armor. And so David went and he stood over the Philistine. He took his sword. He said, do you mind if I borrow this? <laughs> he took his sword. Now I need to also explain, if you read here, it tells you that part of what the Philistines did when they oppressed the Israelites, the Philistines controlled the iron that came into that part of the country. They would not allow the Israelites to have any iron weapons. As a matter of fact, when the Israelites needed to sharpen their iron farm implements, they had to go to the Philistines to get them sharpened. You remember reading that? So the only people that had a sword that was made of iron was the um, Saul and Jonathan. You'll read about this later. But the sword of Goliath, it was a masterpiece. And it took both of his hands to even lift it. And so David takes the, the sword of the giant and with it, it's been sharpened and ready for 40 days he cut off the giant's head. What does the Bible tell us that uh, happens to the serpent? There's a war between the seed of the woman, Christ, and the serpent, the devil. And the serpent bites on the heel of the church, but his head gets crushed in the end. So David, you know, someone can get wounded in their arm and their leg. They go home heal. They'll come back and fight you again. But if you take away their head, they're not coming back. So he was going to make sure. And he cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel, can you imagine the look on the soldier's face? They've been all making bets and passing out money and David's going to lose and couldn't get anyone to take their bets. All of a sudden they see the giant stumble and go down. They see David get on top of him and heck off his head. That's kind of grisly. And then he holds up Goliath's head. And they see the army of the Philistines melting back. All of a sudden, the whole attitude of the army changes because of David's victory. They all let out a big cheer and they start to charge. What's happened to their courage? First of all, a little ashamed that they've been afraid. 
Now the whole army buys into the victory of David and it becomes their victory. What gives us courage to be victorious? The victory, did Jesus defeat the devil? Did Jesus have a battle with Satan after 40 days? Did he win? What did he use to win? The word of God. That's the rock. That's the stone that doesn't change. And what else did he use? A sword. What is a sword a symbol of? The word of God is quick and powerful. Hebrews 4, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it says, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. Now where did David live? I want to finish this chapter. David lives in Bethlehem. Who lives in Jerusalem? King Saul lives in Gibeah. That's the other direction. Why does David take Goliath's head to the city of the Jebusites? The Jebusites still had not been conquered by Israel. Not until David became king were they conquered. David brings the head. He says, see what happened to the Philistines? He said, you guys have a chance to leave. Several times he told them to leave. They said, the weakest people in Israel can't you. He says, Our, the blind and the lame in our city can defeat you. You can't get in this city. David brings the head of Goliath to Jerusalem. And it was sort of a warning. Later that becomes the capital city for David. By the way, Jesus becomes king of the new Jerusalem. And David makes his capital in Jerusalem. And then I just got to explain here at the end here. And he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner? Who, that, that was, Abner was also the uncle of Saul. Whose son is this youth? And you might be thinking, oh, does he get dementia? He was the musician. Don't you know him? You said you loved him earlier. He doesn't ask who he is. He says, whose son is he? Why? Because whoever beat the giant, their family becomes tax-free in Israel now. They get special privileges. He says, whose son is this? Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I don't know. So the king begins to inquire of, of uh, the young man, whose son the young man is. And they finally found out he's a son of Jesse. That David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. See what he's done? He's gone to Jerusalem. He's shown them. And he comes back. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. And Jesus would come from the stem of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So this is a story not just about De uh, David, friends. It's a story about Jesus. It's a story about how to fight giants. Have you ever felt like you're in the Valley of Elah and, and you're being intimidated by the enemy? We need to have that faith and that courage. It's not really about us. It's, it's about the Lord. And Jesus came to set us free. And if he can give David the victory, he can give us the victory. Amen?